Hi everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Venicia. This is the Woolly Worker Knitting Podcast and today I am finally joining you for episode 28 of the Woolly Worker Knitting Podcast. I know it's been a while. I think I've missed one or two weeks of regular podcast scheduling. There wasn't really any particular reason. I guess um, I was working on the secret test net so I couldn't or sample net. So I couldn't talk about that a couple of weeks ago and then I was away so couldn't film and edit. So yeah, I took a little impromptu break from YouTube, but I hope that you're happy to see me back. I'm definitely happy to be sitting down and finally chatting about knitting. I've had so many things bumbling about and I just can't wait to get it all out. I am a bit out of practice, so I hope that you forgive me if this becomes a little rambly or is less prepared than usual and also if it takes me a while to remember what I wanted to say about each project because some of them have been there for a while. So let's just get started and then we'll do um, we'll do it in the regular format. What I am wearing first, this is the Louder vest by the Crea Bea, Rebecca Klo. I test knitted this earlier in the year and it was released. If you want to snatch this pattern. I did the vest version but there's also a sweater and a cardigan and mine is a v-neck. I really like wearing that with uh, shirts. This is kind of like my Hawaiian jungle tiger king shirt that I, I really like and it, it's getting warm enough that I can wear shortish sleeves but this is actually still really nice to be wearing a vest on top of because then it keeps my core warm. I really like the fact that I sized down from what I would maybe have done before. Uh, this is a size 2 and I feel like it, it it is closer to my body so it provides more warmth which I find really enjoyable and because it has cables and rib that's the thing it also has more of a tendency to constrict a little bit and I just think that it's nice to have a variety because I've already done some drop shoulder very oversized vests that the shoulder came all the way down on the the arm but this is more of a fitted kind of at least upper body and I really really enjoy this so yeah there are a couple modifications I did to this pattern if you haven't seen my previous video is that I used twisted rib details instead of regular rib and then I also mirrored the cables so that they would be facing away from each other which I thought would just be a little bit of a, a nicer touch or detail and this is really easy to do if you wanted to do that modification as well. So all the details for that will be down um, on my in my Ravelry project pages for every pattern that I will mention so if you have questions about any of this or you, or you want to know the yarn amounts, the color names, etc. Check the description below and check the Ravelry links. Clearly out of practice. But yeah, that was for the what I am wearing. I will now talk about my finished items. There's I think five I think five, uh, but we'll see. A couple of them I don't have, so we'll get to that when we get to that. The first finished item I want to talk about is my Birds of a Feather shawl by Andrea Mowry. This is a uh, part of her knit along that she does every year, the DRK March to May 2024, uh, this year obviously. Uh, and yeah, I, I was kind of at a certain point last time we spoke and obviously uh, I have <laughs> finished it. So the way that it's constructed is that you start here at the bottom of this point and at the beginning everything is symmetrical and you're, this is <laughs> really hard to show, you, you're increasing on both sides basically at the same regular amounts. Um, yeah. And it increases uh, the same on either side. Then at some point you're going to stop increasing on one side and keep increasing on the other side, which gives it this slight asymmetrical look. Um, and it's mostly garter and there's a few rounds of lace, as you can see. Some of the lace, the lace sections are smaller than the garter, so the stripes aren't all the same length. I think it's just very visually interesting to look at. The shape of the shawl is triangular, but like I say, it's a asymmetrical triangle and it's kind of interesting because the point where you measure the depth is not the point where you started or anything like it, it, I find it interesting mathematically that you form a point but it's not where you started from or ended from so yeah I think it is really interesting to look at and the fact that the lines of this aren't going necessarily in the direction that you expect so I like the shape of this as well because it provides that little bit of triangle to wrap your back in but the ends are still very narrow which provides the opportunity for wrapping it around you like you would a scarf 
uh, or you can tie them to each other. So I know I look like <laughs> such a grandma right now, but I really like the versatility of this item and the fact that I've been wearing it a lot indoors because it is so heavenly soft. Usually with a few of my other neckwear accessories, I've not necessarily cared about how soft the yarn was because Chatin wool, for example, is a bit more scratchy than merino wood, for example, but it is so warm, so windproof, almost waterproof as well for like a light rain. And I've been wearing my Chatin wool neckwear all the time when I'm out, but it's not something that I would cozy up in indoors. Whereas this is Surrey alpaca and superwash merino, it is absolutely appropriate to just wear like a cloud, like a pillow. It is really, really comfortable. I'm doing this all in the wrong order, but yeah, um, this is by Andra Maori, uh, a very kind viewer gifted me the pattern from my Ravelry wishlist, which was so appreciated because I, I really, really wanted to, to make this pattern and I had the yarn for it and um, I it's my first time doing an Andra Maori pattern. The yarn I used quickly is uh, Skin in the Stitch Superwash Merino in the color The Iliad, which was based, um, inspired by The Iliad book. And then the Surrey is Cumulus by Fiber Spades in the color Early Grey. And I had two skins of the Early Grey and one skin of the Hand Dyed Superwash. And I'm really pleased to say that I was playing a heavy game of Yarn Chicken and I so succeeded. Well, technically I was short of the Surrey for the last two rounds, which had a lot of stitches, but um, you can't tell at all that I ran out of yarn and, and had to adapt. You really can't tell. I, I can't even remember where the end is. I think this is the the end edge. So yeah, I just ran out of the Surrey, so the last Surrey stripe is just like one or two rounds narrower than the previous Surrey. Um, and I didn't, and I just had like a tiny little bit left over of the uh, Merino one. So I followed some recommendations on Ravelry on how to make the pattern, like how to adapt it for using less yarn than it requires. Normally you'd have to use one and a half skin of hand dyed, so like 600 meters, but a few people have identified ways to, to, to make it use less yarn. So basically when you're, um, you're constantly increasing up until a certain point in this version of the pattern, you stop increasing sooner and then you kind of have to adjust the lace motifs as long as you keep the number of stitches the same all throughout, you'll be fine. So for the lace, you're doing those yarn overs, which is increasing, and then you're also doing some knit two togethers and slip slip knits to decrease. As long as you're balancing these out, then it doesn't matter. And they don't even need to be that symmetrical. Like, honestly, I'm quite a perfectionist and I like things to be right and just the way they are. There were a couple of times here where I was missing a stitch or two and I just fudged it. And, and, and I can live with it because it's so not noticeable. The other thing to mention for the lace, I guess, is you get this little eyelet and the goal is to um, keep them on top of each other. So you've got, I think, six holes. As long as those six guys are on top of the six guys from before, then it looks good. So all the notes for that will be on Ravelry, like I said, it's been a while. The other thing I did was I used an Icelandic bind off for the top and I can't really show you because it is so small and, and hard to show, but it provided a really nice edge. It kind of looks like an I-cord, but with like only one or two stitches. It is stretchy, not as stretchy as this garter that is knit on 3.75 millimeter needles with only one fingering strand. The original is on four millimeter. Um, so obviously this provides a very, very loose gauge and stretchy fabric, the garter. So you really want to match the fabric with your bind off. And I think the Icelandic bind off works totally well for that. Um, it was a bit of a pain to weave all the ends and I wanted to be careful and not have them slip to the right side. So I left my tails a little bit longer maybe than I usually would. And it bothers me when I see them on the wrong side. I feel like it almost looks like I've not woven in my ends because I can see little bits poking out. But I think I just have to live with that. Uh, there was not really a way of carrying them up. The distance is too, too large. But yeah, I really like this. It's really hard to take some photos of that, but I've attempted to do, well, my boyfriend has attempted to take some, some photos of me wearing it out. So I'll be showing those on screen. Sorry if I've been distracted by looking at it, but I, I really like it. Um, I The other thing to mention is that at the beginning it was 
smaller than Andrea's dimensions, obviously, because I had done less repeats. But I stretched it out to block it, and I didn't even stretch it out like massively, it's just garter obviously could stretch out longer. I used a lot of blocking mats. And in the end, I've got the exact same, if not larger, dimensions than the original. So having used less yarn, I can get the same amount of fabric, which is mind-blowing. And I'm really happy that I didn't have to compromise on anything. And I'm really, really happy with the size of this. I don't feel like I needed it to be that much larger, because then it just becomes a little impractical. And when I'm wearing it at my desk, I'm finding it really nice and covering. And it made me... 100% crave more shawls in my life. I really, really want more wraps. I don't know if I love the simple, you know, symmetrical triangle shawls. I think they're not as interesting. But I also don't want to go interesting for the sake of going interesting and then not knowing how to wrap it around my body. I think a triangle is just so easy to, to wear and wrap. Um, and it, if you want warmth to be provided, that's the way to go, probably. Maybe I can buy myself a little shawl pin and, and go full um, Highlander. Um, but yeah, I could totally also make another one of these. I have seen one on Instagram recently that was in a bright pink for the hand dyed and then a bright pink Surrey or mohair. And I think that would look really good. I mean, the combination, the possible combinations for this are so endless because you can play around with you know, this hand dyed had a few different colors and I brought one of them up in the Surrey. I could have had a red or pink Surrey or a brown. It really works well. I think my hand dyed was variegated, but it doesn't really take away from the lace. So have fun with it. I really highly recommend this pattern if you have one lonely skin of hand dyed that you don't know what to do with. This would be perfect. Maybe even the hand dyed Surrey and then a normal merino like Send This Garden Sunday or something. That would be really fun. So let me just check if there's anything else I wanted to say. Yeah, if I was to make it again, I might do a couple modifications. Like I could do different types of increases for the sides, or I could do a different type of center spine decrease, which I think I talked about in my previous video. And I definitely mentioned on my Ravelry that that's a modification I could see myself making. But I really like this. I'll put the total cost of this below. It actually wasn't much because I got the main skin on sale and then the Surrey Alpaca was a gift from a, an advent swap that I did last Christmas. So my partner from the swap gave me two skins of Surrey from Fiberspace. So that was a cheap project and one that I, I really love and I loved making it. It didn't feel like it was too long because you know when you have a shawl and you have a billion stitches towards the end when your rows are extra long that can be a bit of a um, slog but i didn't feel it that way with this project because it was a manageable amount of stitches and it didn't keep increasing at the end like you stop increasing pretty much halfway through the project so it didn't feel like you were getting further and further away from your final goal so yeah that was a huge success super happy with it can still wear it a lot uh, i've worn it inside but i've not worn it as a scarf yet outdoors but next time i go on a walk i'll definitely wear that with my big v-neck coats so let's keep with the neckwear theme and let's talk about my second finished item this was a test net for mary wallen so i guess a little bit of background i was doing a sample net and then i finished that I was on a really tight deadline. Then I was thinking, okay, I'm almost free. I just have this one lingering thing I need to do, which is a test knit. And the deadline for that was like even later in May. Um, and this was in, in March, but I was still feeling like it would be nice to, to get started on that. And I really want to work on my yellow card again by Mario Wallen, which is a color work project. But I wanted to get rid of, I wanted to do this color work project first, tick that box and then start in the, the yellow card again. So, I had applied for this test knit. It's for the John Arben annual, which I think comes out in autumn, so it'll still be a while. We only had a little drawing that we could apply from, and I really liked the color scheme, and I also obviously like anything from Mary Wallen. So I signed up, got selected. Mary Wallen suggests using British Breeds, which is her brand of yarn, and I am really tempted to one day purchase it and make something out of it. But this time I thought I already had enough of yarns from my stash. So in the previous episode, I showed you the colors I had selected from stash and I was feeling very proud of myself for having, in my opinion, matched the colors really well between British Breeds and Jemisons of Shetland Spinrift. So here we are, we have done it. This actually genuinely took me two days to do uh, over the weekend. It was 
so fast. The longest bit was to do the ribbing, that was pretty boring. And the cast on as well, you have to do a cable cast on, alternative cable cast on to mimic the knits and pearls. That was a, a, a long thing to do. This is the smallest size of the pattern. Um, the longest size is definitely a lot of stitches to cast on, testers have said, but this was fine. Uh, and then the color work was just so addicting. It was a joy to work on. Uh, I'm so, so, so pleased with my color choices. It looks really satisfying. Like the kind of visual effect of having those two tones, a dark one, a light one, alternating all throughout the motif is just so effective. Um, I used, again, the technique of spit splicing my ends just to make the joint neater and I think that worked really well. I'll show you my beginning of rounds and you can see that it is very seamless. So you can see the kind of like fold here where it was folded. That's the beginning of rounds. Um, I did it on 2.75 millimeter needles because I have a loose tension, so that's the um, needle size I required to meet gauge. Then I did the ribbings on 2.5, so it was a really small needle project. Um, I really don't have anything else to say. It really was a joy to work on. I guess the pattern was not structured the way I would normally have done it. It was really much split into lots of different parts, and I feel like that could have just been all fitted into one chart. But it was kind of like you have a table with the colors and then you have a table with the different alternating motifs and then you have the charts and it was just like needlessly split in my opinion but i don't know what format this is going to come out when it comes out later in the magazine um i will put a few photos of me wearing it outside it's an interesting shape and size because it is a little droopy so it's not fully insulating as much as my other cowls are but it is still small enough that it doesn't feel like you have too much fabric to work with that you don't know where to put i think the longest size of this you can wrap it around your neck twice um i think i still prefer the cowl construction of having a big tube that you then fold and sew shut with its cast on edge i prefer the tube cowls for sure as opposed to like, well, I guess this is also a tube, but you know the, I prefer the ones that go in this direction. I hope you know what I mean. But this was was great. It was obviously that much faster because the tubes that I prefer, you are knitting twice as much fabric because then you fold it. So um, yeah, it is a lot more knitting, but this was a really satisfying quick project. I'll put the total cost of this below. I think it used in total like 50 grams of the Jamesons, but it was still like 14 colors. So if you don't have any Jamesons and you're looking to buy some, this will still be a bit of an investment, but it used like one or two grams of each color. I'll put in my Ravelry the quantities, but I don't have that precise a scale. So maybe, you know, it would make the difference between 1.5 or one and two. Anyway, uh, it would be excellent for scraps. There's also a five color version of this. Um, so you don't have to necessarily splurge for the entire rainbow palette. And it'll be really interesting to see when it comes out what other colorful color combinations people come up with. So I think that's it for this one. It doesn't have a name yet that I know of, but I'm really pleased to have finished my test knit then early on. And um, yeah, it's a really, really, really nice color palette and I'm happy I've selected those colors that I know work well as substitutes for the British breeds from Mary Wallen so that if I want to do another pattern for Mary Wallen in the future, now that she basically only uses British breeds in her samples, um, I know what I can substitute it with. There's a fair amount of other colors that from British breeds that aren't in this that I still need to figure out what would be a good substitute from the Spinrift yarns, but I'll, I'll come to that. Uh, not in this video. Okay, the next pattern, uh, I guess we can talk about my sample knit. So uh, I was doing a sample knit for Jing Fiber. Their collection actually is going live today, this weekend. So if you're watching this on Monday, it's just live now. Um, the color I knitted with was actually called Glimmerite or Glimmerite. I'm going to say Glimmerite. 
it feels wrong. It's a precious stone, I think. Um, and I don't have the sample with me, obviously, because I sent it off pretty much two weeks ago now. So I will leave you with a clip I took of past Venetia describing the item, showing it off. And hopefully I'll have also some photos to put in there. Um, Jing Fiber has posted a photo of the item, so I'll also put their photo. And yeah, I hope that that video from the past mentions everything. But if not, editing Venetia will work some magic and add anything else. See you all soon. Hi, so I will quickly talk about the Helix pullover that I made for uh, a sample for Jing Fiber before I ship it off today. So this is what we have in its beautiful multicolored beauty. It is a really nice jumper. I made the size medium and I made the version with sleeves. There's also a version that doesn't have any sleeves and instead just has that rib detail um, at the underarm. I'll try and see if I can put some photos of me modeling it so you can see what it looks like. But keep in mind that this isn't my regular size and also that this hasn't been blocked. I was really hoping that with the blocking the lace slash rib would really open up. As you can see, there is potential for that to happen because it's a really stretchy fabric. I made this using a strand of, I'm guessing their Superwash Merino fingering and a strand of their mohair and they were both in the same colorway, which um, I don't know at this time what it has been named yet, but when I release this video, it probably will have been named. So I'll put the name of this colorway below. I was pleasantly surprised actually to realize when I was trying this on that I, I didn't find it to be the itchiest thing ever. Like I'm quite sensitive to mohair, but, um, and, and it is a close fitting neck, for example, the halter part, but I didn't find it to be too irritating and I wasn't like dying to get rid of it or get it off my body. It's such an interesting shape and such an interesting construction. I had so much fun doing it. You start off by doing this little neck and then you put some parts on hold. You do the front and the back, they are the same. There's no short rows, so there's no front and back. And that's the same for the, the entirety of the sweater. The only shaping that you do is basically just increases for this panel. What I appreciated about the pattern from Jessie made was that when she asks you to increase in panel while maintaining the lace motif, she tells you exactly what to do and how to do that. So some of the increases were made with like a make one left or make one right or yarn overs uh, or pearls, make one left pearls. Like it was really um, straightforward. If you were just reading line by line, it was quite addictive because you were like looking forward to incorporating the new columns of yarn overs. And then you join in the round and you do the body and then afterwards it was really interesting basically the process that was used to cast on the sleeve as you can see it is only really joined at the underarm and i really like the way that it looks it's really seamless as you can see that lace column in the middle follows on right up and i really like that uh, so at first it seemed flimsy because this was the only part that was connected but afterwards you pick on for the ribbing, which is here, um, and that added some structure, uh, some integrity, and yeah, just strength to the whole uh, armhole. I'm not worried about it moving or anything. You do all the bind-offs in knit, which is really uh, nice, and it avoids flaring and flipping. There was no need for a particularly stretchy bind-off. Um, so yeah, the construction yeah was the body, then the sleeves, then that ribbing detail. And I really, really enjoyed the process. Honestly, it was super enjoyable to work on. I thoroughly enjoyed working with this color changing yarn that was such a pep of color in the moody March month we were having. I enjoyed working on a pattern that I didn't fear wasn't going to suit me. I tried it on and I, I still think it's not something that I suit or would want to wear, but it was nice to have the opportunity to see what this kind of shape would look like on me. It was weird. It's the kind of garment that looks amazing in photos, I assume, but not something that I would know what weather to wear it in because of the fact it's a mohair garment. But a large proportion of your body is exposed at the shoulders. Um, but yeah, uh, this 
in total used exactly my two skeins of fingering and I have a little bit left of mohair because the mohair had a longer yardage but I was really playing yarn chicken which stressed me out in the last couple of days of my sample knitting experience I didn't really want to ask them to send another skein for what would have been like three grams so in the end I, I ran out of yarn in the last couple of rounds of ribbing for the sleeve but I uh, unraveled part of my swatch like maybe a third or a quarter of it and I used that to finish the sleeve off so I didn't have to compromise on sleeve length I made the body a little longer back when I was doing that part because I knew that when I would when they would block this garment and stretch it out widthwise I would lose some centimeters at the bottom and I didn't want it to be too cropped because it already is a cropped garment I really am looking forward to seeing what they do with this, how they style it, how they take photos of it. Um, I, I'm, I'm really happy with this sample, it's my first sample knit and I'm proud of it. It's a quality that I'm happy with. And yeah, my only regret is that I just wish that there had been more time where I could have blocked it myself and, and really saw the project in its full glory, but I, um, I, I trust that they will, they will block it and open that lace right up. I didn't make any modifications to the pattern. I used a needle size that was recommended in the pattern, which was 3.25 for the body and 2.75 for the ribbing. So quite like a tighter gauge or smaller needle size than you might usually use, but that's because you, um, you don't want the rib to be too large. And I highly recommend the pattern to anyone. There were videos that were helpful throughout for the difficult parts. It's the kind of pattern that you don't really know what's going to happen or what's happening, but if you trust the process and you watch the videos, then you can visualize what is happening. So yeah, just trust the process, enjoy it. Um, it's really rhythmic. There's one row where you're doing some lace and then one row when you're working even. So it was actually very mindless and meditative, especially the sleeves where there were no decreases and the body when there were also no decreases. Those parts were just so easy to work on on the train or watching TV. And it only took me two weeks exactly to make from start to finish. So I hope that you like it and maybe this inspires you to make your own one for this summer. It, it was it was really great, really enjoyable. I think it works really great with hand dyed actually. Um, it's very extra, but um, if you can't be extra with your knitting, when can you? And that's it for me. Let's go back to the normal video. Okay, the next item is something that you may recognize from um, a previous video back in autumn. This is the Enchanted Pinecone Socks by Amanita Knits. Uh, as you can see, it is a very autumnal knit and maybe you can already see uh, one problem but if not I'll, I'll mention it later. I'll show it off here, I took some photos so you'll see that too. But this is a nice little pair of pinecone socks and they're so cute, very neat. I use Retrosaria Mondim for this, I can't remember the color but it'll be in the description as always. Um, I think I, I, I talked about this in a couple of episodes, I had started the cuff and the pine cones and then I finished the sock and then I just never cast on the second one, like nothing at all. I was put off because it's a folded cuff, so it means twice as much ribbing and I don't know if you're like me and the ribbing of a sock is like your least favorite part. Uh, it was really putting me off to just start and do that much ribbing uh, straight away. So uh, I really shouldn't speak about this for too long because anything that applied for the second sock, I had talked about it for the first sock back in those episodes, so I'll put a link up here of the video where I talk about this in more detail. The thing to notice is that I had struggled a lot with the heel instructions uh, for the first sock. I, I kept on getting that one part wrong, I was never having the stitch counts that was required and I just maybe thought I was in the wrong headspace or just couldn't understand it. And then doing the second sock six months later, I was having the exact same problem, so I do think it is possibly a problem in the instructions. Um, I think I had one other person message me as well that they were struggling with it. So yeah, I'm not sure, but it was fudgeable once again. It was something that you could get over without too much frustration. I was really frustrated with the first sock. The second sock I was just, ah, uh, just move things around and, and do it. The pine cone motif is very reminiscent of the Field Collection by Camila Vad. Um, the way that you do those little guys is by having a combination of, you know, 
uh, knit one yarn over, knit one yarn over, etc. in the same stitch. So you're doing a very big rapid increase, you're doing a little bit of cabling and then a little bit of decreasing in the subsequent rows and that creates this sort of bubble and having those bubbles stacked on top of each other is reminiscent of a pine cone. So that's how you do them. I think there's a few different variations of those stitches. Um, I know in this particular pattern they were charted, which was really good. I think in some other patterns that I've done that use this sort of pine cone, they're not always. I think in the grow hat they were charted, which was good. I, I definitely prefer charts for, for textured knits like that. It's just so much easier to visualize. Um, and then there's a little bit of bubble texture all throughout the foot, which is really good. It breaks it up. It makes it easier to reach your goal. The heel is a, I think someone called it a strong heel. So it is quite interesting to look at and it's not something I've done a lot before. Something I'm not happy with with this yarn is it does show, well, the yarn or my tension. It shows a bit of rowing out for when I was doing the heel on the the wrong side. I don't know if you can see it on the side here. There was a bit of knitting back and forth, AKA purling, and you can see the tension difference there. I did them on two points, two five millimeter needles, both of them, but sadly the second sock is larger, indubitably. And I never noticed that until I finished them, which is really my bad. I should have noticed earlier that when I put this one on top of each other, like there's a massive difference. It's not maybe massive. No, it is. It is. Look at that. There's so much extra fabric, especially like the foot length. To be honest, when I put them on, it is noticeable, but not to the point that they're not wearable. And because this is 100% wool yarn with no nylon, I was planning not to wear these outside anyway, and they would just be worn indoors, which is a shame, obviously, because like, what a lovely cuff. That would be so cute to show off. But you know, in winter and autumn anyway, wearing my tall boost boots, they wouldn't be shown off. Like if I had those little shorty um, shoes that would show off the ankle bit, I don't know, I don't have many shoes. But I I will wear them in the house because I really want to see if the Mondim wears well or uh, in a passable manner. Do I need to mend it? I still have some leftover. Do I need to um, never buy this yarn again because it doesn't uh, fare at all? I hope that they felt a little bit. I hope that they don't break. And I am happy I finished it. I'm kicking myself for leaving it for so long. There's really no reason to have one lonely sock for so long. I think I get excited about knitting socks, but I never follow through on them. Like The excitement dies fast. So I shouldn't be so eager to cast them on if I'm not motivated because then it just ends up being lonely whips. It happens once a year that I've got like a sock that's alone for six months. The total cost for this is that, uh, down below. I think it was pretty much like half a skein of Retrosaria Mondim. So I could probably make another pair of orange socks, maybe a bit shorter than this and without a folded cuff. Um, but I think what I might do is I could just like give this yarn out to someone because I don't think I want another pair in the exact same color. I'm a bit fed up of this color. Uh, orange is, is kind of funny because it's it's not something that I find suits me like in a sweater, but with socks anything goes. But yeah, this is kind of nice because it was ticking off this item from my autumn to-do list of patterns. It was on my like planning video and everything. So I feel like I'm, I'm not going to go into detail about this right now, but I'm, I'm really not in a mood for planning for spring and summer knits, etc. Because I'm still having so much fun going by my previous autumn and winter plans and to-do list and matching my stash with my library of patterns. I'm having a lot of fun just following through on those plans and executing them that I'm not really in the mood to make new plans. And it's nice to have that balance because usually I'm, I'm having a lot of fun planning and buying yarn and, and, and following the new trends and the new patterns and everything. But right now I'm just really in the mood to slow down and and just not get caught up in the next thing too fast because then you're not enjoying enough like the place where you're at at the moment. So yeah, I'm just uh, enjoying enjoying the moment, which is, is really nice. And I'm not uh, saying to myself like no new cast-ons or no impromptu cast-ons. Like if I get excited by something that appears online, I will do it. 
and uh, if there's a new test knit that I want to do, I'll definitely apply because my needles are so clear right now. I am ready for anything. Uh, but I just haven't seen any test knit that I want to do at the moment. Um, so yeah, it's good to have the opportunity to, to jump into something new if needed, but right now I'm just following my plans. The next finished item is an Oslo hat by Petite Knit. Yes, again, I think this is my fourth one. Um, but I think I've actually given away a lot of them. So uh, one to my dad, one to my boyfriend, and one to my dad's friend soon. So um, this is the first one for me, I guess. I was using some yarn from Stash. This is the hat, by the way. Uh, it's like nice and navy, but I will show some close-up photos. It's actually not just navy, there's some bits of purple in it. It was Stash I had from my... Um, I think originally I had bought this yarn to make the Sycamore sweater by Petite Knit. It was for the stripes. Uh, I had bought that mohair. Then I bought the um, Midnight color, Alpaca 2 from Isayer to make a spring vest number two, well, vest number two spring edition by My Favorite Things Knitwear. And then I made this nice navy vest that I love, love, love. I love it so much. I love the fabric and the color. And I had leftovers from that. So um, I was in the mood to clear the needles and, and, well, no, clear the stash. I wanted to use my little lonely balls of yarn. And I thought that I had enough with pretty much 75% of a ball of mohair and over a skin of the alpaca too. And I don't know why I thought that, because the hat requires one skin of mohair. So I realized quickly after making the double folded um, brim, I realized I wasn't gonna have enough mohair. It was Isayer color number 100. So I put a call on Instagram. I said, does anyone have half a ball of this color that they'd be willing, like I'd be willing to pay? Uh, can you send it to me, blah, blah, blah. And, and a, a few people actually like volunteered their uh, leftovers. So that was super kind of you. Uh, one person ended up sending me an entire ball. So that was really funny because then I used pretty much 25% of that ball. So what I am left with now is literally the quantity of Isayer Mohair I started with. So I didn't really do a good job at clearing out my stash, but I did use a lot of the alpaca too. So I guess that was the very just noteworthy thing to say about this pattern. The other thing is that I used the same needle size and made the same size as I usually do, which is the size adult medium and I used 3.5 millimeter. I did use wooden needles to try and make it, I guess, less loose, but I still think it came out larger and floppier and looser than other projects and, it, and my other Oslo hats, I mean, because I always use the fingering held double um, or one time I used a DK and this time it's a fingering and a mohair and I think you can really tell the difference. I should have gone down to a 3.25 if not a 3 or maybe made a size smaller. I think I would have preferred it to be a denser fabric. This is just a little too floppy as you can see. Um, we took it out for photos yesterday and we were laying it down on the floor and it like kept on flopping away. It was quite a windy day. It was not heavy enough. Like it just kept on on, on going away. So um, yeah, I think it's nice to have a variety and exper experiment with different fabrics. Like I've made one in fingering double, one in DK, now we have a fingering mole here. So it's really actually interesting to study those differences and realize what we prefer. I know from memory, um, Amy from Ninets had made one in Peergant a long time ago and she didn't like it because it was actually way too sturdy and too dense and it was like just holding its shape too well and she didn't like that and I'm having the opposite problem with this one so it's really funny to see how it's the same pattern the Oslo hat this wasn't I didn't use the pattern of the Oslo hat mohair edition I just used the same pattern I already owned um and it's interesting to see that just with the same pattern you can get so many different looks and textures groundbreaking I know um so yeah, I think that's it. I'll put here the total cost of this project. Again, not too, too expensive um, because it doesn't use that much yarn, although Isayer is obviously more expensive than some other brands like Drops. Um, the mohair isn't itchy on my forehead. Um, and even though this hat is a bit bigger, I still find it wearable and it's really warm. The mohair is definitely warm. If anything, it's not that I find it itchy on my forehead. It's just that I find my forehead will sweat more when I'm wearing this than my like superwash merino ones. 
So I don't know if I would rush to make another Oslo hat with mohair. It was a good stash buster, but I think next time that I have an extra ball of mohair, I'll make a little bag, like the Winter Clutch by Petit Net or the Honey bag or whatever. Or I could make a little scarf from Sari Nordland, for example. Those would be my preferred ways of using a ball of mohair. I don't think I love it in a hat. And I've said this before, but you know, there's the little typo in the decreases for the Oslo hat, and I've put the corrected version on my Ravelry project notes. And I think for this one, I also did a variation of the slip slip knit by um, knitting it through the back loop on the uh, following row. But you really can't tell the difference at all because this yarn is so dark. So those are my decreases. Okay, we're flying through. So the next item, I don't have it, and it is the Penny Gloves by Petite Knit. Yes, once again. I think this is my sixth pair at this point, or seventh. Um, I made these for my boyfriend's mother, um, who watches these videos. Uh, I made these quite a while ago, actually, but now I can finally talk about them because her birthday happened this weekend and she has received them. So I used Lang Yarn Cashmere, which I talked about before as being a good substitute or replacement or yeah dupe for Cardiff Cashmere, although they, 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 they are both quite pricey. Um, but the Lang Cashmere, I've seen it go on sale on Lovecraft, so I, I thought I would be sneaky and, and switch over and buy Lang if I wanted to use the Cardiff Cashmere. And I had used Lang before for some penny gloves with only one ball, could make a pair for my aunt. Um, and I really liked it, but now having used a different color, the purple, I'll, I'll put photos here, um, I, I found it to be different, the quality. I found it to be thinner than Cardiff Cashmere, a bit stringier, it, it felt a little bit more flimsy, it almost felt a bit greasy. Um, not in a spinning oil way, but like, just kind of in a squishy, but in a bad way, like, dampness, almost. It's really weird. I didn't find that yarn to be as enjoyable to work with as I did the Cardiff Cashmere. I've had really good experiences working with that. Uh, so now I'm kind of in two minds again about buying the Lang Yarn Premium. Maybe it depends on the colorway, but yeah, I just wouldn't rush to buy it again. Um, but take that completely as like, it's my personal experience and maybe it really was just that colorway. I also had another bad experience making these penny gloves because I thought I would be sneaky and again only use one ball for two gloves and not run out, but I did run out of yarn and I had to do quite a lot of unraveling and, and yarn chicken. I really wanted to maximize the amount of, you know, the, 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 the length of the gloves. I wanted the gloves to be as, as covering as possible with the amount of yarn I had. I really should invest in a scale that goes for more than just like one digit after the coma. Um, but yeah, I struggled to, to, to play yarn chicken with this pair, but it was all worth it in the end. It did leave me with a few more ends to weave in, which was annoying, but it's all good. Gifted them to Lorraine. She really likes them. Uh, she said that the color was great. So um, good thinking there. I think Ross, my partner, helped me pick a color. So I'm really happy that she likes them and she got them on the trip that she took for her birthday and she was using them on the trip. So that was perfect. Okay, so that's it for my finished items. Let's talk about whips. I hope that you enjoyed those finished items. I know it was quite accessories heavy and then obviously the garment, I couldn't wear it and show it off to you. Um, I definitely prefer watching podcasts that show off garments, but what can I say? I was just in a mood to do little things here and there. I think all of my works in progress are going to be garments. So the first thing is a lento. So I showed this on the podcast once, I think, then I took a break and then I picked it back up. I'm doing this as part of two knit-alongs. There's the Scottish Spring knit-along hosted by Joe from Designs Made by Joe. Uh, the deadline is kind of for the Woolly Good Gathering, I think, in a couple of weeks. And um, yeah, the, the point is to make something either by a Scottish designer or with, with Scottish indie wool producers or dyers. So here's what we've got. I finished it and it looks tiny. <laughs> I definitely am going for, I was going for a more fitted version. Um, I think this will block out and get larger. It's super wash merino and alpaca. Um, and yeah, I think it definitely needs a, a good stretch and the ribbing is cinching in. But yeah, uh, it, it will fit. Uh, this 
color makes me really happy. The yarns I used is um, one ball of Superwash Merino uh, from Giddy Yarns, hand dyed uh, in the color Misery, inspired by Misery from Stephen King. Really, really like this. It is so wintry, but it's beautiful. And I decided to match it with a strand of fingering weight yarn, not a lace mohair or anything. I did a lento last year, pretty much at the same time of the year for the lento Cal by Rebecca Clo. So my first version of a lento was made with drops in alpaca and brushed alpaca silk in this like rusty orange colorway. So this is definitely a uh, opposite lento. And I'm using uh, Isayur Alpaca 2 again in the color like E0, which is their natural white. The problem with this is that this is actually a bit too yellow uh, compared to this. As you can see, it's quite obvious when they're next to each other. A at first I thought it would still marry well and it wouldn't look off. But on closer inspection, sadly, the Isir Alpaca one does uh, come off as quite yellowish, which bothers me a little bit, but not too much to the extent of not liking the project. I thought it would be a smart thing to do to uh, tone down the variation of the hand dyed because it is quite variegated, like the red is obviously very contrasting to the blue, the bright electric blue is contrasting to the white. I thought it would be fun to try and marle it with a color that appears in this yarn already, aka white. I could have marled it with a light blue, that could have been interesting, but I wanted the blue to pop. So this is what we got. And can I say, I am absolutely amazed at how well the speckles and the yarn has distributed itself. This is one skin of hand dyed and it wasn't alternated or anything, so it's just one ball. Like the dyeing of this is so even. The red is in appropriate proportions and quantities and locations. Like it's not strike too striking or too weird at all. The blue as well is really nice. I'm I'm really really pleased. I can't see any pulling or patterning or anything. So I'm really really enjoying how this yarn has worked up. I, I hope that I'm not regretting those words when I'm making the sleeves. Okay, let's talk modifications. So Lento is such a customizable project and I felt confident just going for it. So the first thing that I did was I cast on, um, not at the neck, doing a double folded neck and then continuing like the pattern calls for. I cast on uh, just under the ribbing and just immediately started with the short rows and the raglan increases. Raglan increases, I did make one left, make one right, as opposed to doing knit one, knit front back. I just prefer the look of the make ones. For the neck, I did this because I wanted the option to come back to it later and decide what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure if I was going to do ribbing or I-cord or twisted rib, a double neck or a single neck. I just wasn't sure and I wanted to just get on with it. And the second reason I do this is because I like the stability of the cast on edge and then picking up for the ribbing afterwards. I just feel like that helps my necklines not stretch out and gape. I cast on for size one, so I didn't have that many stitches at the neck, and I increased the raglans to a size two, so I'd have more ease, and also because I, I was on a different size needle, I'm using 5.5 instead of six millimeter, my gauge is tighter than I need, uh, before block anyway. With block, I might be able to stretch it out to the max, but also I just wanted to make sure I'd have enough room at the underarm and at the bust. But like I said, I'm not going for mega oversize and I'd be happy with just a nice fitted sweater as long as I can breathe in it. The other modification I did is I added a pearl seam, or like a pearl faux seam rather, uh, just at the underarm. You can see like this like subtle little line. I think it's just really subtle and I, I like it. Really easy to do. I think it, it works really, really well. Then I did a split hem, which I, I don't do a lot. I was feeling inspired. I wanted to try a few different techniques to see how to get a neat separation. Here the separation occurs um, at the full pearl seam, so I think it looks fine. It doesn't look like it's massively stretched out because you already have those horizontal bars of the pearl stitches, so having a horizontal bar between the front and the back hem doesn't appear out of place. I did the front hem smaller or shorter than the back hem, 
I also shortened the body and cropped it a little because I wanted to wear this over dresses, possibly over spring and, and summer. I always say I want to crop my sweaters and then I never commit and fully crop it, crop it. Like sometimes I crop it enough for high-waisted trousers, but I've never committed enough to crop it to a dress type of styling. And I'm really happy. I think this time that's it. I really cropped it. So we'll see when I, when I uh, block it and try it on. I'm really hoping to have this, um, I have this vision. I have a, a dress that's like blue and white and floral. I can totally see myself wearing this on top and I really hope that that's what I'm able to present this with maybe next podcast episode. So yeah, I think that was a lot. That was a lot to talk about. Then I picked up for the neck and I did, um, I think like 11 rounds of rib and then I did a sewn bind off, not tubular. I will make my sleeves full length, not three quarters because I don't think I like three quarters on me. It bothers me and I, I just find it looks odd and like it's either not finished or not on purpose. I'm, I, I just, I, I, uh, I'm really happy and eager to take this on because I have put it on hold while I was doing other things and I wanted to show it off like in this easy way without yarn being attached. But I'm looking forward to having this stock in it knit. The yarn fabric is really squishy I'm loving holding uh, uh, two fingerings together at this big a gauge. It's nice to have things other than just always mohair or surrey held for like a second strand for a DK weight. And I'm looking forward to in the future having more items of knitting that are just made with merino or like I say, just two strands of fingering. Last time I did this, I had to... Um, use magic loop for the sleeves which is annoying but uh, if that's what we have to do that's what we have to do so yeah i think i'll be finished with that really soon i'm probably going to try and tackle a sleeve today and really eager to wear this color which is really me okay next item uh, which i think will be the last one is another petite knit project i don't know what happened why is this so petite knit heavy I'm usually not like that, but um, I was going on a trip to Liverpool with my boyfriend uh, a week ago and I wanted to have a fingering weight project with me to take one because I didn't want to have too much things going on uh, or like having too much things in my suitcase or, or bag. I wanted to be a monogamous knitter for the trip because I knew it would be a good opportunity to get some work done on the project because that would be the only thing that I would have with me. And two, because I really like wearing fingering weight things and it would be a good reason to kind of kick myself into starting one because it will take a while before I can wear it. So I had shortlisted a few items. I put it on my Instagram story. Um, the other contender I will actually mention just briefly in a bit when we talk about plans and acquisitions. Uh, but this is what I ended up taking with me. It is the Friday Tea by Petite Knit, um, which is a raglan t-shirt. So here we have... Here we have it. It really doesn't look like much. It is a lot of knitting, I promise. It is also one of those projects that normally you cast it on and you do a double folded neck and then you keep going. But I decided to cast on uh, under the neck and just start off. So this is why it looks a little weird and definitely very wide neckline. I'm trying to find where the short rows are. I think this is the front and then this is the back. So yeah. I love the colors. This is Send This Garn Sunday uh, by, by Send This Garn. <laughs> so I think this is a petite knit colorway, which is whipped cream. And then this is just the normal Sunday colorway. Um, and it is the color 8521. And I think that those colors are just really nice and springy. I had plans since last spring to make this t-shirt. I had yarn and stash, which was in a different colorway. And that changed my mind and I'm happy I did. These colors are more me. A lot of you guys have been saying that on Instagram that like th those colors are, are really, really great. So I'm glad you like it as much as I do. I can't wait to wear I can't wait to wear them. The yarn is amazing. It is super squishy, um, super soft, very enjoyable to work with. I'm I'm totally loving this fingering weight knit on my wooden needles. I'm using 2.75 instead of three. Again, just to avoid having too loose a fabric, making size small. 
I didn't gauge swatch, which probably wasn't the best idea because having changed needle sizes and using this uh, broken rib motif is is a bit unpredictable, but we will see. Um, I, I just, we will see. This is a, a raglan, like I said, but it's quite interesting because the raglan is like over 10 inch, uh, over 10 stitches long. So this is what it gives you. So it's really nice to see those lines kind of being broken up with those angles. Um, the fabric definitely stretches out. And right now I am literally three rounds away from splitting for sleeves. And I can't wait. The rows are so long right now. There are so many stitches. It is really enjoyable to work on though, even though it's laborious, because you always have that like knit one, purl one round of rib. And you're like, I want to get done with that. I want to keep going, get done. And then you have a nice round of knitting even, which just flies through. Then you're back in the knit one, purl one. And then you have the stripes to break things up, which also is super enjoyable. Um, I, I can't wait to, to, to split for sleeves though. And then I don't know if I'll... I probably will keep on the body for a while and then either do the neck or the sleeves. I'll, I'll try things on. I'm planning to make the sleeves a little less long because if you see in the pattern photo, they come down almost almost like this shirt is. Um, I don't know if I want the sleeves to be quite as long, especially if they're a bit more fitted. Um, and then I, I don't know how I'll make the body yet. I am playing a little bit of yarn chicken with the white, but the ribbing of the body and everything will be done on the green. So I can be more flexible about um, just stopping when I run out of white for the body if I do. I found the beginning to be quite labor intensive. Um, it's a petite knit pattern, so I, I knew that I would understand the instructions, I would like it, uh, it would fit me, like, you just know what to expect with petite knit, which is also why I chose this project to be working on while I was traveling. Uh, but the beginning was a bit of a labor of love because you have um, short rows and stripes and texture to all work on at the same time. The short rows with the texture weren't too hard, but changing colors while doing short rows was a bit new for me, I think. And the other thing I want to mention, and this is the end of the episode, so my mind is already a bit scattered, so please bear with me, but let me know if I'm crazy or not. I think there's sometimes some errors in Petit Nets patterns regarding make one left, make one right on the pearl side and on the right side, and vice versa. I feel like the instructions she gives for the make one rights and stuff in the glossary and explanation of terms is different than what you normally see online. The way that I see it online the most and have learned it and like is what I think is true is to do a make one left, you pick up from the front and you knit through the back loop and to do a make one left purl it's the same, so you pick up from the front and then you purl from the back loop and those two will be left leaning. But I think Petit Knit says that for the make one left purl, you pick up from the back and then you purl normally. And I think the important thing to note with those things like that is that it then depends on what is actually written. So this is the explanation of the terms in the glossary. But when they're actually writing it down in the pattern, when you're having your raglan markers, etc., then depending on what they said was a make one left pearl and when, what, which one was a make one right pearl, they maybe will use that in a different way when it comes to the actual pattern. So I hope that that... Has anyone else experienced this or do you know what I'm talking about? I think it happened a couple of times where I was talking with someone and we were discussing how do you make a make one, a make one left pearl? And, and we had different definitions of that, like just intuitively. So yeah, I think there's a lot of confusion. And I, I think I may have a, a very slight case of dyslexia sometimes with left and right, which doesn't help with things at all. Long story short, I ended up having six short rows, six increases leaning on the wrong side like the incorrect side um, for one of the raglans for like the sleeve or something. And it, it bothered me a little bit when I realized, I was like, oh, I, I got this wrong. I didn't want to start over. I laddered down and fixed two of those increases. So in the end, I only have four increases in this total project that are leaning the wrong way, uh, the first four. And it 
is absolutely something that I can live with. It's not something I probably would be able to see right now unless I inspected every single raglan. So it's fine. It doesn't bother me. Um, it just isn't the first time that I noticed this with either Petite Knit or My Favorite Things Knitwear that the definition of a make one on the wrong side is different um, or inconsistent even between patterns. But yeah, please someone tell me that you've also noticed or this has happened to you. And then the other thing to mention with this pattern is that you're having to change your stripe colors quite frequently. So there's obviously no point in cutting the yarn every time. You're much better off just carrying it. And you're also then having to do smooth color transitions. Petit Knit recommends a technique for the color change, which is simply, um, you know, you, you pick up the left of the stitch underneath, put it on a needle and then knit both of them together. That's kind of how you avoid the jog. I found that to be quite difficult to do when you're thinking about broken rib because of those uh, pearl stitches and everything and raglan increases as well. So I did a different technique for the um, jogless color changes and I started doing that after I was doing all the short rows because again there was just way too much to keep track of and I, I, I wanted to get into a groove first. So uh, this is my beginning of round, I'll show you it's on uh, this side of the raglan. So hopefully you can see that the color changes aren't too bad um, compared to the other side, which um, is not a beginning of round. I think it looks fine. And uh, my technique, which I found on YouTube, I didn't invent it or anything. I'll, I, I'll just link the video below. There's no point in me explaining it and not demonstrating it. So I'll leave the link down below. It's also in my Ravelry description for the project. And I found it to be super easy to do, easy to remember and invisible, so uh, efficient. So yeah, that's that's all. So things to mention about this project, color changes, short rows, the small gauge, it's a long project. I like the texture. I can't wait to wear this. Uh, I think it'll be mega wearable because it's like a, a t-shirt and fingering weight, it'll be very light and the colors are excellent. So yeah, really, really enjoying this project and looking forward to making some progress then by doing the sleeves and the neck as soon as I split for sleeves. So let's talk about uh, plans and acquisitions then. I actually haven't bought any yarn in like the last three weeks, which really great. I'm having like fun just doing what I said I would do. Like I said, I'm, I'm just using the stash I have. Um, I was wanting though to, to participate in Amy Share's Make Along. I have a few projects in my queue from her and one of them is the slightly sassy V that a viewer gifted me. So yeah, thank you so much for doing that back a few months ago. I'm finally casting it on. And I, 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 I had some yarn in stash, but it was kind of earmarked and I had this vision of this very drapey yarn. I really wanted some alpaca silk cashmere fingering yarn. I, I've worked with this base before for a fingering weight top and I really loved how flowy it was. So I wanted to, to use that yarn again and I had some but it was earmarked for something else so I allowed myself to then purchase from uh, the Fiber Fox. She was having a shop update so I knew it would be shipped quickly and it was for some really summery springy like pops of colors. I was hesitating between a blue and a pink. I ended up choosing this blue. So this is I think Summer Incarnate. Um, so this is a beautiful beautiful blue. I think it's I guess showing pretty accurately on camera. Um, I got two skins of it, which should be just enough to eke out a v-neck cropped three-quarter sleeve slash long sleeve if we can get away with it little sweater. And uh, I can't remember when her knit along finishes. You don't have to finish the item and I think it's in May. So I've not done a lot of progress, which is why I'm putting this in the swatches and plans video, uh, part of the video. But I, I had cast it on because I was maybe thinking of taking that on the train to, to Liverpool, but um, it is a compound raglan, so it's actually quite <laughs> quite effortful to keep track of what you're doing. There is a page in the pattern with a table where you can tick off when you're reaching the sections and it's keeping track of when you're doing your increases for the raglans and the v-neck and everything at the same time. So top uh, notch effort here from Amy Sher to make the, the pattern as easy as possible to follow. Because it's a v-neck, you're having to do a lot of knitting flats, which also was a bit uh, annoying and maybe why I didn't want to take that, take that one on the train. But I've cast it on and this is what we have so far. It really isn't much, is it? Um, 
I, I had started with a different size needle and I found it to be way too gapy. So now we're back on the three millimeter needles to hopefully give me a stitch gauge of 24 stitches per 10 centimeters, which is like your uh, average fingering weight gauge. Um, it is still looking quite loose. The yarn isn't helping. It is massively slippery. Last time I had used this yarn base, I used metal needles and it was a nightmare. This is why I'm using wooden needles this time, but it is still very much trying to get away from me. But um, the increases I also found a little bit trickier because uh, the way that Amy has structured her pattern, you have one marker and then it tells you, you know, knit, like knit to the marker, make one left, slip marker, knit one, make one right. Like you, you have one marker, but you're going to have two increases. I find it easier when the designer writes it so that they isolate the raglan stitch or stitches with two stitch markers. And then that way you know that whenever there's a stitch marker, you're increasing. So what I did was that the ones that Amy says to place, I put them as like a big stitch marker. Then I knit the raglan stitch and then I put my own little stitch marker next to it. So there's two stitch markers here. One of them is what Amy said to do and the other is my one. And so that, that way when it comes to, you know, remove the marker or like knit to marker when it comes to splitting for sleeves, I'll know which one it was that Amy refers to as opposed to like having two identical stitch markers on the needles and not remembering which one I had placed first. So that's my trick to, to making it easier for myself to know when to increase. Otherwise it was just too much for me to keep my, to keep track of um, with the, with the raglan increases on the wrong side. Again, I'm having this nightmare with, with make one left and make one right. But yeah, so I haven't worked on this since before my trip to Liverpool. Uh, I'm not particularly eager to work on two fingering weight garments at the same time. So I probably will wait until I'm further in the Friday tea to pick this one back up. But I would like to have a nice little photo to put on Instagram for Amy Shear's knit along, obviously. So that is one plan that's going to happen soon. The yellow cardigan I am finally able to cast on because I finished my color work um, Shetland wool little guy. For the yellow cardigan I've decided to do a provisional cast on and then start. It's bottom up and a lot of people have complained about the moss stitch border that it rolls up and they wish that they had done some normal ribbing. So I've decided to again just postpone that dilemma and just cast on provisionally so that I can decide and possibly rip out afterwards if I did it wrong. So little tip for you. I really hope to have cast this on provisionally for the next podcast. It'll be a very slow growing process, but I'm saying this here to be accountable. I hope to have cast on the yellow card again by next episode. I, I showed you the colors before. And then the last plan that I want to do, I actually would love to have your help for. Uh, I want to do another cardigan and I, uh, not, not the yellow cardigan, a normal cardigan. I'd love to have your opinion. I have three ones sh shortlisted. We've got um, the Eva cardigan by Petite Knit, the cardigan number eight by My Favorite Things Knitwear, and then the flurry cardigan by NK Strict. And the um, cardigan number eight is the heavier one. I think it's a 15 stitch gauge. The flurry is 16, and then I think the Eva cardigan might be um, possibly 20 or 21, like a DK gauge. I have the yarn for all of them. Uh, editing Vanessa is going to hate this, but I will put a photo of all the patterns and then the yarn I plan to use for it. And maybe you can tell me. I'll probably put that on Instagram as well, but I'd really love to know what you think would be nicer to work on or to wear. The flurry is with Isayer Eco Soft, which I find so, 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 so wearable and soft and I love wearing it. It will be really hot though to wear in summer because of that alpaca content. The other ones uh, are yarns held with a lace alpaca, which is also very soft. So no more hair to be used here, but yeah, the Eva will probably take longest because it's a, a like tighter gauge. With the cardigan number eight, uh, I've been having it on my list forever. So yeah, let me know your thoughts on that. Um, please don't give any new suggestions for cardigans and throw another wrench in the mix because I, I, I have the choice paralysis. I really just want to keep using up my stash, especially the quantities uh, of yarns to be held double. It's really satisfying for me to fill my spreadsheet of my little knitting stats and to be getting a lot of yarn out of stash. Um, I was thinking of maybe doing a little update at some point. I've got my 
spreadsheet here that tells me uh, I am I'm currently in, in net positive so I have uh, bought more yarn than I've uh, used up in my knitting which is not what I wanted to do but we're four months in we still have eight months to go before the end of the year and we're on a really good track so if I keep knitting up those two yarn for one sweater and cardigan quantities I think we'll be making some real dents in the stash as opposed to the accessories which aren't very helpful but yeah uh, let me know if you want an update on this kind of like knitting resolutions um, maybe after six months or the yarn stash update or um, kind of knit knitting stats in my knitting spreadsheet let me know if this is something that interests you I guess to start wrapping things up, I really wanted to give you a huge thank you if you watched this video until the end. I know I was gone for a while. I don't know if um, you will have seen this video like in, in your YouTube recommendations or subscriptions. I don't know if it's going to fly under the radar. I hope not because it was really nice to sit down and chat to you guys. Um, if you like this video, don't hesitate to give it a like and subscribe if you haven't already. I normally try and post a podcast every other week and hopefully some other extra videos every now and then. I have a lot of ideas and just not a lot of... Motivation isn't the right word, but just like capacity to carry out the plans I have to the quality I, I want them to be at. Um, and I find it hard sometimes to just get ready to film. And I wish I already had the footage and I could just edit. I know some people say that they don't like editing. I'm kind of the opposite, where I just wish I could just already be editing as opposed to filming. But yeah, um, the next kind of interesting things are gonna happen. Uh, I would love for you to join me for a knitting live on Friday. Uh, I'll just check quickly what the date is. So that'll be Friday 19th of April. Please join me on YouTube at um, 6 p.m. BST, so British Summer Time. I'll put the time here below. Uh, it'll just be here on YouTube. Come to my page or um, you'll find it. It'll be on Instagram as well. Uh, I've done a few of those lives before. I'll just stay on for probably a couple of hours. I really, really would like it if you were here. It'll be kind of a nicer way instead of doing a knit and chat to catch up. Um, it'll just be a live knit and chat. And yeah, I, I really hope to see you there. And if you've been coming to them already and um, you say hi, you know, I, I notice you. Thank you. And then lastly, very, very exciting update is the Woolly Good Gathering is happening in a couple of weeks already. Um, I'm really happy to say that Marlene from Marlene Knits is coming over. She'll be staying at my place and we're going to the festival together. I'm so, so, so excited. We've been chatting a lot and it'll be really great to meet her in person. We have some really exciting plans for the weekend. We're going to go probably see a mill together, maybe go to Glasgow, definitely go to Edinburgh, visit some yarn shops. Um, Marlene says that she definitely plans on vlogging some of it. I hope that we get to sit down together and do a video together, just like here in, in my flat. And if you have any topics that you want us to talk about or questions to answer um, or a type of video that you want, like if you have any ideas for the kind of content that you want to see from us, being together in the same country, please let us know. Give us suggestions down below. We'll also ask that on Instagram closer to the time. But um, it, it's such a great opportunity and we're going to have so much fun. So uh, I know that a lot of our audiences like overlap. So it'll be fun to have this kind of like crossover episodes. Um, and then the second thing is that we're kind of thinking when, we're, when we'll be going to the festival, if you guys wanted to kind of have a, a meetup or hang out, that would definitely be something we're interested in. But we have to know if there is interest and if we need to book something. So uh, I guess the question is, are you guys coming to the Woolly Good Gathering? Are you coming on the Friday or the Saturday? And would you be up for hanging out afterwards or during either going to a pub or a restaurant or a cafe and knit and chat together? Just like do a little meet and greet, but yeah, more meet and greet is not the word. A little knitting group um, would be would be really fun to do. and. I know some people are traveling to Edinburgh for the festival, so um, it would be really nice to be able to do the, those things together. So would you be interested in that? And if so, let me know of the, the kind of your preferences. So would you want it to happen on Friday or Saturday? Um, so yeah, let me know about that. And if you want to talk about it on Instagram, definitely message me there. Uh, Marlene and I were thinking maybe if we're going to have enough interest, we could do a little group chat on Instagram or on Discord. So definitely wanted to put that out there now, even though the festival isn't for another couple of weeks just to get things started but definitely follow us on insta to keep up to date with um where we'll be at the festival 
So that's everything from me guys. I know it was a bit of a longer one. As always, there's just a lot to update on. I have a couple of things I haven't even talked about that I'm saving for next time. But it was really great to sit down. I'm happy that I got to catch you up with not only the knitting, but also yeah, the exciting plans that are about to happen, um, the yarn festivals, and the fact that it's, it's gonna get warmer slowly, but I'm still very much enjoying my um, cold weather knits. And I'm really, really happy to be knitting things from my queue. Uh, I've been having so much joy in that. So let me know maybe if you've been having some spring knitting being done. Are you still sticking up to your winter plans? How do you feel about summer knits? Are you loving the um, those kind of natural fibers like cotton, linen and everything? Or are you a merino person all the way? I'll sign off now and I'll keep working on my knitting then this weekend. I hope you have a great rest of your day. See you guys later and happy knitting. Bye!